Hey there, my name's Gary Sims and this is Gary Explained. So Apple has announced some new MacBook Pro models and in doing so is announced two new Apple Silicon processors. That's the M1 Pro and the M1 Max. So if you wanna find out more, please let me explain. So it was generally anticipated that Apple would release some new silicon, uh, maybe new CPU cores, more GPU cores, that kind of thing. And we thought because of previous branding that Apple would call it the M1X following what they've done with other versions of the processors it puts in the iPhones. But it didn't do that. In fact, it released two new processors, the M1 Pro and the M1 Max. And of course, what we're missing now is the M1 Pro Max, if we wanna keep in line with the way they named the iPhones. So these are really, really interesting processors. So let's have a look. Now the Apple M1 processor, the original one, is what they call Apple Silicon, which means it's Apple's in-house designed processor, in-house designed uh, CPU, in-house designed GPU with its heritage coming from the power VR GPUs from Imagination. And basically it's the same CPU design, GPU design that you get in the iPhones. The M1 was based on the A14 Bionic, and then there were more cores and greater speed added, so you got the M1 processor. And I've got a whole load of videos here on this channel about the, the M1. I'm testing it for performance, I test it for battery life, and you can find all those videos here on this channel. Now, the M1 Pro, the newest uh, chip they've released in the series of two, is actually a kind of the M1 beefed up by higher. And what do we mean by that? It looks like the CPU architecture is still the same. It looks like the GPU architecture is still the same. Because when you look at the numbers, for example, on the GPU, Apple say that the M1 Pro is twice as fast as the M1. And that's because the M1 has got eight GPU cores and this one has 16. And when you look at the graphs for the performance for the CPU, you can see again, the, the kind of the performance increase is relative to the number of cores. And we'll look more in details of those in a minute. So basically my guess is we're looking here at an A14 architecture CPU, the same as what we got in the M1, now in the M1 Pro, but lots, lots more of them. Now the overall performance of the M1 Pro CPU could be more than just the fact there's been a core increase count. There are a few other factors to take into consideration. For example, there could be a higher clock speed. Even if it's 100 megahertz, that's gonna have a difference. We've got this new uh, memory bandwidth that we're gonna look at in a moment, greater access to the memory, which of course will help the CPU. And there could be other things like the way the cache is working. So those are other minor factors that could overall boost the single thread score of the CPU. So what do we know about the M1 Pro? It's a 33.7 billion transistor chip. That's up from 16 billion transistors in the normal M1. They're built on the same five nanometer process and it can address up to 32 gigabytes of memory. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. And it can support two external monitors. So if you include, of course, the monitor on the actual laptop itself, that means you can get up to three monitors. You've got things like Thunderbolt 4 and so on. But when we get to the actual CPU and the GPU, this is very interesting. In the M1, what we had, of course, was an octa-core processor, a four plus four setup. Now we have up to 10 CPU cores in an eight plus two setup. And eight plus two in this setup means that there are eight high performance cores compared to four high performance cores in the original M1 and two power efficiency cores uh, where there, are, there was a four plus four, four high and four power efficiency in the M1. So a change of the dynamic, no longer is it kind of half and half. It's much, much more laden towards high performance with those uh, energy efficiency cores when you're doing much more simpler things. Let's just say like watching a video, all that needs to do is kind of talk to the Wi-Fi and pass on the video over to the media decoder, the CPU, not really very much involved in that. And Apple has given us some great information about the caches on the high performance cores. We know it's 192K of instruction cache per core, 128K of uh, data uh, cache per core, and a 24 megabytes of L2 cache across those eight cores, maybe split into 12 plus 12. And then when we get to those two power efficiency cores, two megabytes each, four megabytes in total, 128, that's L2, 128K uh, instruction cache, 64K uh, data cache. And when we get to the GPU, it literally does look like Apple have just put in twice as many uh, GPU cores. So therefore all the numbers that we associated with the M1, of course the M1's been very well tested, literally just double as you increase the number of GPU cores. 
And then after that, Apple announced the M1 Max. So this is a kind of a maxed out version of the M1 Pro. And the big difference here is the memory bandwidth. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. And the number of GPU cores. Now this one can actually address up to 64 gigabytes of RAM. It's using four external interfaces to those RAM banks, 128 bits each. And that of course is giving a total of 400 gigabits a second uh, in overall memory bandwidth. Again, the same eight plus two uh, CPU setup, but now we have a 32 core GPU. And again, looking at the numbers, they say that's four times faster than the M1. So it's literally the M1 had eight GPU cores, the Pro has got 16, and the Max has got 32. Seems to be the same GPU cores, just keep adding more and more in there uh, to make things faster and faster. Now, the way that Apple has arranged the memory is quite unique. It's actually including the memory on the actual chip itself. It's not part of the processor, not part of the CPU or the GPU, but it's actually there on that same physical package, not going across a motherboard and then into some slots where there are, you know, there's some DRAM. That still means that you have to have access to that external memory. And the way Apple are doing that on the M1 Pro is using two 128-bit LPDDR5 interfaces, one towards one bank and one towards the other, with a total of 32 gigabytes that are addressable. Now with the M1 Max, we've got exactly the same thing, but now we have four of them because there are 64 gigabytes that can be addressed. And so each of these banks has their own uh, unique interface that's giving this high throughput that we've mentioned earlier. Now, before we talk about the actual overall performance claims by Apple, let's just look at the die sizes of the M1 compared to the M1 Pro and the M1 Max, because we've gone from 16 billion transistors up to 57 billion transistors, and that's quite a difference. And so here you can see the three chips next to each other. Very good that Apple have actually given us die shots and actually you can look at some of those there and start to work out, for example, on the edges there, those uh, DDR uh, interfaces. We can probably take a guess at where the GPU and the CPU are, but let's look at the M1. We know that was 16 billion transistors. People have actually taken photos of it. We know it's about 120 square millimeters. We now jump up to 33.7 billion transistors. So that's about 2.1 times the size, so that's gonna be around 250 square millimeters. And then you go up again to the M1 Max, it's about three and a half times the size of the M1, so we're looking about 420 square millimeters. Also, if you look at the uh, M1 Pro and the M1 Max, you can see that the top half is very, very similar. So it looks like literally when Apple added in the extra GPU cores, they just kind of extended downwards towards the bottom, extra uh, memory interfaces on the left and the right, and then the GPU stuff uh, below that, and all the stuff that was above it, which would be the CPU cores and the existing GPU cores and any other stuff like that, kind of it's very, very similar pattern if you look at it. Now, obviously the big thing that Apple have done here is throw CPU cores and GPU cores into the SOC, claiming it has greater performance, and that will be true. But we've got to remember here, we're talking about multi-threaded performance, and that's absolutely fine. That is a valid way to measure performance. But of course, there are gonna be instances when you're doing things on your laptop where it's not gonna be using 10 CPU cores to do it. It's gonna be using one, maybe two. And in that sense, the performance of the M1 Max and the M1 Pro is not gonna be that much difference to what we find in the uh, M1 in the existing uh, MacBooks and MacBook Air and so on. Of course, when it comes to heavy duty stuff, and for example, if you do ray tracing, each little part of the scene that's being rendered can be rendered on a different uh, CPU core. And of course you can get the help from the GPU core. And so therefore having multiple of those is really gonna help. So for media creation, I'm sure that these extra cores really, really make a difference. However, there will be instances, as I've said, uh, let's say for example, web browsing, where having those cores, you're not gonna see such a huge difference compared to the M1. So taking into account that we're talking about multi-threaded performance rather than single-threaded performance, let's have a look at what Apple are claiming. And so here Apple have plotted the performance of the M1 and the M1 Pro and M1 Max. This is for CPU performance. Notice that the M1 Pro and the M1 Max are giving you exactly the same CPU performance, even according to Apple, because it's basically the same uh, CPU setup. And they've also got in here a four-core uh, laptop from uh, Intel and an eight-core 
uh, processor from Intel, laptop processor. And what these are, according to the small print, when you go digging around, that's the i7-11850G7 and the i7-11800H. And the uh, the small one, the four core one is actually four cores, eight threads. The big one is actually eight cores, 16 threads. And they can use up to 45 watts uh, on that one, although Apple have that peaking past 60 watts here on their graph. However, they're saying very confidently that the performance of the M1 Pro is at least 1.7 times greater than that of an eight core, 16 thread Intel processor, the i7-11800 and it uses 70% of the less energy to at the same performance level. So those are quite amazing figures. And according to where I've seen my own testing of the M1, I've actually got no reason to doubt those at the moment. And when it comes to GPU performance, uh, Apple are saying that the M1 Pro reaches the same kind of levels as the RTX 3050 Ti for discrete PC laptop graphics. That's a very interesting claim, but a way, way less power consumption. We can see the RTX 350 Ti is over 100 watts. Apple are claiming a 30 watts. Now, whether that's 30 watts just for the GPU part or that's 30 watts for the whole processor, we don't know. But that's certainly a very, very powerful claim there by Apple. And as I said, according to what I saw on the M1 processor, I don't have any reason to doubt that at the moment. When it comes to the M1 Max, they're comparing that with the GeForce RTX 3080, a mobile version of that. And again, we're looking here at a power consumption of over 150, 160 watts for the PC one. And Apple are claiming somewhere around 50, 55 watts for the uh, new M1 Max. But again, achieving similar uh, performance, maybe higher performance there by the RTX 3080 if you're just looking at Apple's graph here. But again, no reason to doubt that. So some very interesting CPU and GPU performance claims there by Apple. Now, the last thing to cover before we go is configurations. If you remember when the M1 was launched, there were versions of the chip with seven GPU cores and there were versions of the chip with eight GPU cores. Now, Apple is still playing the same game, although it's talked about 16 GPU cores, 32 GPU cores in the Max version. It's talked about 10 CPU cores, eight plus two. Actually, it's offering, I think, according to the website, as I've been through it, about five variations of these chips. Let's have a quick look at the variations. So the cheapest of the new processes is actually an eight core CPU. And I'm gonna guess that that's six plus two in this case with a 14 core uh, GPU. You can get an upgrade then and go to the 10 core CPU. So eight plus two, but still with a 14 core GPU. And then there is the kind of the best of the M1 Pro, which is the 10 core CPU and a 16 core GPU. When you get to the Apple M1 Max, only the 10 core version is available in terms of the CPU. So 10 plus uh, 10 cores, that's eight plus two, but there's a 24 core version. So that will be three times the performance of the original uh, M1. And there is a 32 core GPU uh, version. And for each one of these processor upgrades, you pay more and more money. So the cheapest one that you can get and the prices of an Apple quote starting from, that is actually for an eight core CPU and 14 core GPU. Now, of course, it depends on your budget. It depends what your use case is for your new MacBook Pro, but you need to choose wisely. Now, one thing Apple even mentions on its website is choose wisely about whether you want the Pro or the Max in terms of memory usage, because if you stick with the Pro, even when you go to the, the best one with the 10 core CPU and the 16 core GPU, you will be at 32 gigabytes of memory maximum. And if you're a real creative doing, you know, video editing, maximum kind of 4K, and you're kind of doing 3D modeling and Blender and, and all that kind of stuff, Unity writing games, Unity, all that kind of stuff you can do, then maybe you're gonna want 64 gigabytes of RAM, which means you're gonna to have to, by default, go with the M1 Max. Even if you go with, let's say, the 20 core, 24 core uh, version, then you still need to get the Max, so you get that uh, amount of memory. Now, the memory is not upgradable. Because it's on the processor itself, on the actual physical package, you can't just open up the back of it, undo a screw, and slot in a new bit of memory when you want to next year or in two years from now. So the memory is a thing that is stuck. And you could probably upgrade other components, 
Uh, I don't know for how easy it is, but let's say like the SSD, but the memory is fixed with the processor that you actually get. Okay, that's it. My name is Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this look at the uh, new processors from Apple. If you did, please do give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget you can follow me on Twitter at Gary Explains and also have a newsletter. Go over to GaryExplains.com, type in your email address. You won't get any spam on that address, but you will get the newsletter and I think you'll enjoy it. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.